Hello, everyone. I hope you are having a good day. Welcome to the UNCTAD's 15th Youth Session, Financing New Models for Youth Empowerment. I'm your moderator, Serena Jom. I'm currently working in the Chief Architect and Data Management Department of Avon Emerald Bank in Amsterdam. Today, our speakers are Mr. Robin Kumar, the Youth Action Hub Mumbai Coordinator and Chartered Accountant. We also have Mrs. Ashma McDougall, President of National Youth Council of Dominica. Welcome. Then last but not least, we have Mr. Dalano da Souza, Assistant Lecturer from the University of West Indies. Welcome. So today, young people, fresh graduates, after years of working hard, studying and learning, face tons of challenges when they step into the labor markets. The lack of capacity building traineeship and the deficiency of an appropriate financing mechanism hinder the access for youth to their prosperous professional life. So how does a youth-centric financial inclusion look like? And what efforts do need to be made in to improve the skills and the employability of young people in the starting point of their career? Mr. Robin, you work closely, you closely follow new technologies and this is definitely the future, we all know that. Do you feel that young professionals are sufficiently equipped to deal with the major challenges and changes this technology brings us along in the way that we work? For example, we start to see that with the pandemic's lockdown, many people start to work from home. And with today's technologies, this is made possible. But the danger is that the human element and networking gets lost. So are there, however, specific things that the employers or lead leaders should change so as to allow young people to thrive? Yeah, so... Uh, thank you everyone for having me here first of all. Now, uh, thank you Serena for the question. And I think it's a very uh, impactful question in terms of the youth uh, that uh, actually is uh, studying in the college at the moment, or we can say that those who are recently uh, into uh, industry where they have started working. If you look at the technological trends and the development trends around, it is very much evolving and the technology which may be relevant at one point in time may become obsolete in very near future. So we cannot say that it's just a one, at one point in time, we can say that a person is aware of a technology and he's equipped to handle stuff, but he has to continuously evolve. So in that manner, I would say that every person who is, uh, who is keen to learn something or who wants to change something, uh, they have to con constantly evolve themselves. And at the same time, they have to constantly upgrade, upskill themselves in every industry. Looking at uh, developing industry, uh, developing countries and uh, developed countries, there is a stark difference between what people study, what people want to, what people should study and the future that we look upon. If, for example, if you look at uh, just the financial industry, uh, we can see that earlier it was too much robust. Uh, it was a lot of mechanical inputs were there. But over the period of time, it has become almost automatic. At the same time, the youth and the people who are very experienced, they face challenges in terms of meeting those uh, robust technological innovations that have been coming in. For example, blockchain. It is very difficult for people to understand it. So overall, I would say that people have to constantly update themselves and upskill themselves because it's just a process. It can't be an end point to it. And if we talk about the human element that suddenly we are facing a shift towards uh, for the past one year we can simply say that uh, the more networking skills that we use to evolve while working in office premises or on uh, offshore premises that is completely gone off so just to work on those approaches every person have to individually put in that effort be it an informal conversation or uh, the way we used to have coffee breaks around when we were in offices we can have schedule some time to and fro from our mentors, from our friends, just to be in touch with what is happening in this industry, what is happening in their life, and just be more updated. 
So I think all those things are a process which people have to follow. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Robin. Indeed, everyone has to put into efforts in practicing networks. Um, and you are also mentioned underprivileged students, right? And yeah. what, why would you say that mentoring is important as well as apprenticeship? And what would be your message to the more senior leaders? So uh, if we look at uh, the upskilling in the industry, we can see that people who have resources to get themselves educated, to get themselves upskilled, they are very much in a competitive race. On the other hand, there are a lot of people and students who lack resources, simply put, uh, they lack resources not just to get education, but also to upskill themselves on the job, whether it is technical or unskilled. So to cater to both those aspects, I would say, when we mentor any student, when we mentor any underprivileged student, the first thing that comes to mind is they are pushing their career, they are pushing their life and livelihood to a next level, which earlier was very difficult. So if we talk about uh, mentoring, it just brings difference to life of just per that person, and at the same time to the life of that family, because somewhere down the line, not having resources, not just catering to one person, but catering to the entire family. So this was one thought which ignited and which drove me towards mentoring students. And second thing, if I talk about senior leadership, people like us and all or, or the entire youth, they look up to senior leadership uh, for different aspects of their life, whether it is personal, innovative, entrepreneurial, or whatsoever. In that scenario, when a person of that caliber guides or advises someone, it really pushes a person from not just uh, uh, going to the next level, but it sometimes give direction, entire direction to the life of the person. Uh, for instance, I'll just take example of Elon Musk, which everyone would be familiar of. The way space industry is changing, the way uh, automotive industry is changing, it has actually not just guided people, but it has made difference to life of people to choose their career path, to choose the way they think towards uh, change. So these kind of uh, mindset, the thought which evolve in a nurturing mind, uh, a youngster, I think these people should invest some bit of their time and it really changes the future of industry and the people across. That's it. Indeed, just like you said, people look up to senior leadership and we all need a role model. And I bet it's also very fulfilling for the senior leadership or more experienced professionals to bring young people abroad. And now I have some questions from Mrs. Ashma. Empowerment can mean a lot, and often we see that young people are not taken seriously and are marginalized in the teams. And what do you think that youth bring to the table when working in collaborative teams? And do you have ideas on how to create a mind shift within public institutions and private business to empower young professionals? Thank you very much, um, Serena, and I'm very humble to be part of this panel discussion this afternoon. Um, thank you for that question. I believe that millennials, they not only are the leaders of tomorrow, but they also hold the key for sustainable development today. And young people are not being taken seriously in the employment arena for several reasons. And I want to start discussing, you know, some of the key factors that I've um, received from persons that I have had conversations with because as an educator I'm approached by many persons from both the private and the public sectors and they cite that as it relates to young hires there's a troubling deficit of youth who are capable of collaborating of problem solving of communicating effectively and so there is some skepticism about hiring young people um, employers also cite a lack of expertise and professional immaturity I mean we often see many of these memes where Persons are saying, you know, you're coming from college and they expect you to have 20 years of experience just coming as a college graduate, right? Um, and however, the, the, the employees are at the same time somewhat reluctant to invest resources in training young people. And that's why I believe it is necessary and easier to teach these competencies early in life before young adults actually enter the workforce. 
young people need to develop new skills. There is a very strong correlation between the emphasis a team has on development and high empowerment. And developing team members sends a message that employees are valued and the organization is willing to invest in them as people. Youth may enter jobs at 23 and they may never be trained within the organization 10 years later. And that definitely has an impact on how empowered they feel within an organization. Um, youth engagement on collaborative teams is a viable approach to healthier youth and community development. And for a team to be successful, everyone's unique skills and strengths, once capitalized, can somewhat help to achieve the shared goal in the most effective way. And so even with youth, with more older or senior staff, as um, Mr. Kumar suggested, the adult support can definitely assist youth in, um, you know, becoming more trained on, in organizations, as well having youthly friendly environments can somewhat um, trigger youth to complete tasks in a meaningful way. And this poses an opportunity for them to learn and utilize new skills. As for diversity, the challenging tasks that, face, that are facing businesses today almost always require the input and the expertise of people with disparate views and backgrounds to create cross fertilization that sparks insight and innovation. The differences that inhibit collaboration include not only national, nationality in this globalized world, um, but also age and educational level and even tenure. And while youth are exposed to learning within these settings, our diverse contributions to teams are immeasurable. But there is a shift. It's a very great shift that is necessary in recognizing the potential of youth in workspaces. In the Caribbean, many youth are exposed to experiencing the delayed retirement syndrome, for example, where many return student migrants are faced with delayed entry into the workforce. And this sets them back years into their career. And I have engaged with many young professionals who are very passionate about the skills that are needed for like collective action. And so rather than following in the footsteps of the generations before them, this new generation of young professionals, they somewhat want to define their own terms when facing the complex leadership challenges ahead. And so in my own opinion, both the public and private institutions need to understand the youth dynamic. And this is very fluid because even among Gen Ys and Gen Zs, there's a, a great disparity in, in, in their own ideals and norms on, in the workplace. And if we genuinely want to tap into the potential of youth, the way we think about leadership fundamentally needs to change. A willingness to invest in young professionals as sustainability change agents is rarely on the agenda of public and private institutions. And so employment of young professionals has not been a focus of economic policies across many countries in the Caribbean. And instead it has somewhat been treated as a residual outcome of economic policies. So youth empowerment must be accompanied by understanding youth and their mindsets. Youth bring a lot of creativity to teams. And so we need to capitalize on that. We need to engage youth in the participatory process. There must be a certain degree of openness to new ideas. Often when younger employees come with new ideas, the thing that they often hear is, yeah, 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 I will take, I will take that under, under consideration. And sometimes the idea is lost. It, it, before it gets anywhere, it's lost. And so this discourages empowerment. We also need to integrate youth voices in policy making and program design related whenever possible. Empowerment requires team members to, you know, make some effort and take some risk. And those leaders who recognize and encourage employees when they see extra effort or risk taking, get more of that behavior in the future. Thank you so much for sharing the, your opinions and this, how it is in the Caribbean. Indeed, youth bring a lot and definitely the openness is needed on the table. And on the other notes, you do research on uh, indigenous people and their ability to get out of poverty and what is needed for the young indigenous men and women to take a living while staying true to their identity. A, is that all possible and what are of poverty among our own Kalinago people it has not been reduced in relative terms and so my study what has made me so fascinated um, with this study is that in more recent times there is somewhat of an influence that indigenous culture has on poverty 
So what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to define the contextual culture of poverty and I'm trying to understand poverty traps and whether their their culture is somewhat attributable to their realities, like which many indigenous youth have now gone on to witness and later experience. So my own study has somewhat realized that they are generational, they're occupational, they're educational, they're aspirational gaps, which somewhat create a cultural trade-off for indigenous youth. Um, and although the aspirations of indigenous youth are quite similar to those of non-indigenous youth, there is still a lot of distance that they have to cover to fill the, to fill the gap. Um, for some youth, for some indigenous youth, it's nearly two times higher than non-indigenous youth. And therefore, with that understanding that cultural diversity plays a vital role in today's globalized world, and that culture is an essential element of sustainable development, it demands for more culturally sensitive policies and development programs that com combat poverty while simultaneously reflecting the voices of youth and to reflect their aspirations. So some of the policies or discussions that are necessary to address that trade-off for youth, as cited in your question earlier, is relative to the revision of land rights. We know that for many indigenous population, there is insecure land tenure, um, and that is a driver of conflict and, uh, and weak economic and social development. And this continues to threaten cultural survival and vital knowledge systems. So there needs to be an improvement of security of land tenure. There needs to be promotion of public investments in quality and culturally appropriate indigenous systems for the resilience and livelihoods um, as this is critical to reducing the multi-dimensional aspects of poverty while contributing to the SDGs. In my own opinion as well, great dialogue is necessary in that realm um, and it is necessary to ensure the participation of indigenous youth when that dialogue is happening. And we know that youth won't participate meaningfully in the planning process unless they are present when decisions are being made and their input is, 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 is invited. And I speak on this topic in the sense that young indigenous farmers, for example, can elevate within agriculture. Um, however, they have poor access to agricultural credits and financial services along with insecure land rights. And so this is a key obstacle for young people and therefore there needs to be a revision of the um, of land rights, especially as it relates to indigenous youth. Secondly, indigenous people have a special relationship with the land on which they have lived for generations and indigenous youth inherit the responsibility to protect and preserve their traditional lands, their resources, the sacred rights upon which their cultural heritage and identity is based. Um, there has to be greater investment in documenting traditional knowledge and that traditional knowledge documentation can take many shapes through written registries, through files, through video, through images and audio in a traditional indigenous language um, or other languages and they need to use modern and more classical technologies. Additionally, language is the foundation of, of a culture and so language holds knowledge amassed for millennial. It holds the stories, it holds the songs, the dances and that is a crucial connection to the linguistic and cultural history. And Lastly, the production and sale of handicrafts represents an, only a part of the complex process of rescue and preservation of indigenous knowledge in the new generations. And cultural appropriation is a crucial problem that indigenous artisans are currently facing. And all, for example, all own locals um, tend to deal with art resellers, mostly foreigners, who acquire large volumes of their handicrafts to be then resold in the city at higher prices. Um, and so obtaining higher prices, obtaining higher profits, sorry, um, these indigenous artisans are not necessarily participants of that. And so we need to, to, to recognize, we need to see the, the indigenous people more immersed, more emerged in the souvenir, in the souvenir industry. Um, and um, although we appreciate the vital role that intermediaries play in the process of com commercialization, we need to see an emergence of community-owned indigenous art centers. So my findings do prove that there are opportunities for indigenous youth to escape po poverty traps as indigenous enterprise still has not been explored within indigenous territories to its potential. Thank you so much, Serena. Thank you so much for your clear elaboration. Indeed, the greater dialogue is needed and youth needs to be present when the, where the policy is made. And now, uh, Mr. Dalano, I have uh, several questions for you. Um, so we often hear that the transition of young people to the job market is full of challenges 
and experience is requested and there is a mismatch between skills demanding, for instance, soft skills and the educational system. And in your point of view, what are the two most important things that the education could look at to facilitate youth to get the first job? Uh, good day and thank you, uh, Serena, for the question and thank you for the opportunity to be here. Uh, very important question. Uh, but in, before I answer, I feel like if, uh, a lot of times what we must do is start to begin uh, by defining in terms of our own understanding what youth empowerment means, because we're speaking in terms of starting a career uh, for youth. Uh, but we must recognize that it means not only um, in the context of the sustainable development goals, which we are focusing heavily on now, but also we must understand that um, youth empowerment can mean different things for different youth. So, and, and, and of course, this depends on many factors, such as the society in which they live and their socioeconomic positioning, among other factors. And I always like to use my own experience to start to illustrate this particular point. I mean, growing up in St. Vincent and the Grenadines, which is where I'm from, uh, in a single parent household with three siblings and a large extended family, uh, we didn't have a lot. Uh, but we did have a mother who encouraged and believed in our abilities and our potential to do amazing things. And what's more, it wasn't a secret. I mean, she let us know at every opportunity uh, that the sky was the limit. And so for me, youth empowerment really meant the financial resources to pursue education and to fulfill that potential. Now, on the other hand, I know a lot of youth from different communities who are not fortunate to be raised in homes characterized by some parenting, a cultivation of self-belief or the resources uh, or the environment uh, to build that foundation for success in order to forge a career path. So for them, youth empowerment or empowerment in general looks quite different from what others uh, would experience, yeah? So if we're talking about the, the important steps uh, that we have to take in order to move forward, I think it's critical that we focus on things such as opportunity. And I talk about opportunity in the context of our educational institutions, and uh, specifically those at the tertiary level. I think it's important that uh, they should place greater emphasis on opportunities for internship. And when I say internships, I mean preferably paid internships, mentorship, uh, or job shattering um, elements to, in, into their degrees and higher degrees, higher learning, I think that's a critical aspect. I mean, there are several universities globally, even within the Caribbean, um, where you complete a degree and you haven't set foot in, in, into a business place, you know? And we're speaking about starting your career and, and that link between education and moving onto your first job, for example. And so something uh, like a, an, an internship while you're, in, while you're pursuing your education could make all the world of difference. It gives you, um, that it fulfills the need for first-hand experience. Uh, and you'd be surprised at how many workers know that would, that would tell you that they got their first start in their current job as an intern. Or that they started, they moved from an intern to a part-time position or a short-term position. And then they became fully um, employed on a permanent basis with some of these companies because companies recognize that through this internship or mentoring or job shattering program that they could find real rising stars, that they could find youth with potential. And I think uh, in terms of our education system, I think we need to embrace this a lot more. Um, having said that, though, um, I, I spoke about the internships and the opportunities, but we also must acknowledge that the private sector can't be given a free pass on, on this. Quite often, uh, even though private sector entities might be willing to come forward in many instances, and I speak specifically or particularly in the context of less developed economies such as ours in the Caribbean, um, these businesses are not able to fund such programs. So you might speak to a business and they might say, you know, I don't mind having a summer internship program, but I can't afford to pay them a stipend. I can't afford to give them a little salary for transportation or what have you. And then that becomes a deciding factor as to whether or not that, that internship or that program goes forward. And quite often that, that proves to be uh, something insurmountable. Now, in our context, I think what we also need to do is recognize the important link now in terms of uh, finding ways to make these things happen despite the challenges that we have. So when, when we talk about um, funding, we need to recognize that funding models mean that we have to apply all sort of not necessarily old, but the modern finance te um, technologies and techniques and mechanisms to youth empowerment. If we think about things such as the blue bonds, uh, for, uh, for example, that have been that, you know, that are becoming more popular now, where we're issuing bonds, of course, as a financial instrument uh, for sea conservation and all these other things in order to fund that, why can't we have uh, greater use of youth bonds, the youth empowerment bonds, for example, where we are putting bonds out there. And I know that 
particularly ethical investors might have a, a bigger interest here, where we're putting bonds out there and we're using that money to finance internships. We're using that money to support universities in terms of their pursuit. We're using that money to help universities and other uh, NGOs and, and youth focused organizations to help young, youth and young people transition into the workforce. Because I always go back to something that I, that I heard once that Hillary, Professor Sir Hillary Becker said to us in a meeting, it takes money to care. And, and that's the reality of it. And we as policymakers and, and, and those policymakers, uh, they need to recognize that there are ways uh, that we can focus on the youth agenda because too often um, the excuse that we get for not helping our youth to kickstart their careers is a lack of funding or uh, a competition for scarce resources that place youth empowerment sort of on the periphery, like Ashman would have said, on the periphery of the national development agenda. And in many ways, that's unacceptable. And we need to, so, so just to round up opportunity and we need funding. Uh, those are the important elements that if we want to help our youth transition uh, into uh, their first career or career switch or whatever the case may be. Thank you very much. As you have said that youth empowerment can be different for different youth. And uh, so far, in most cases, internship has been a beneficial step to take. And in the company where I work for, we also have internship desk to pro provide platform for fresh graduates to step into the corporate world. And it has been proven to be very successful. And touching upon the podcast you do where you talk about political, legal, and social issues, how can we create the mindset shift that Ashma has talked about earlier on? Do you see a role for advocacy and how to go about this for employers become more aware of the difficulties that young people actually face and how would they act upon it? Uh, yeah, thank you for that question. I, I think, um, of course, there's a role for advocacy. I, I think in terms of um, where we are and the work that we do on the podcast that, that I co-host with a colleague of mine is that we're, it's, it's really meant to bring knowledge to the fore, to bring conversations to the fore, um, so that the ordinary person on the street would recognize that there's nothing that they can't have an opinion on. You should be able to have an opinion on the, on, on the political process, on the policies of your government, on even international policy as well. And as any individual, um, you should have uh, views on those things. And that's what our podcast is trying to engender, to, to show persons that, listen, you don't have to have a university degree or a PhD or what have you to have a view and to express that view. And, and that's critical. And, and that's this, more of those conversations are what we need in order to, to, to fuel that sort of mind shift of uh, changing the mindset of our people that Yes, these things are happening, but we cannot be focused solely on our own individual condition, that we must take stock of our environment, not just within our own context or in our own countries, but also globally as well. Now, a part of an uh, important role of the advocacy that we, we hope to get going or we hope to see more of in the Caribbean is when it comes to the employers, for example, and our policymakers, there is always room for advocacy because at the end of the day, so a lot of our leaders can become sort of entrenched in their position. And we see it over time where even younger new politicians start to fall into the mold of their, of, of their predecessors, for example. And it continues where there's a, a perpetual, uh, or, you know, this sort of proliferation of exclusion of young people from the decision-making table. And we need to look at those sort of things and to recognize that advocacy plays an important role. And in doing so, in terms of the employers in particular, we need our employers to recognize that youth empowerment is good business. And if you think about the context of a, a consumer, a characteristic of any good consumer is effective demand. And what we mean by effective demand is not just the desire to purchase something, but you also have to have the capability to purchase it. You have to have the finances and the funds to purchase it. And, and going further, if you think about the fact that so many of our, uh, such a large percentage of our populations, now whether it is from a country perspective or globally, is characterized or made up of, some, of a high percentage of youth, it then stands to reason that empowering our youth economically is good business because we need our youth in order for, us, for our economies to advance. Because if our youth don't have the purchasing power to spend within our economies to help our economies grow, then where are we going? Yeah? So I think there's a lot, there's a big role there for advocacy there. Um, and I think, unfortunately, how it goes sometimes is that uh, we don't get the appeal directly or, or the, the businesses or the private sector doesn't take our appeal seriously enough sometimes. 
So I feel like sometimes we have to go to the policy makers who then have to enact or uh, to, to bring these business, these business leaders and the private sector together around, you know, around the whole notion of youth empowerment. Because, I mean, when you think about it, and, and it goes back to, to, to Economics 101, Ashma, you know, the, the, the assumption we make about businesses is that they're profit maximizers, yeah? And so sometimes it, and you have to convince them that profit maximization can and should incorporate youth empowerment. And there's a role for advocacy in that. Thank you, Mr. Delano. Um, that is uh, the questions that um, the moderator have um, prepared. And now we have received questions from our audience. Um, so what do you think that, that are the necessary skills that the youth should start to build in order to seize all these opportunities? Uh, Anyone would like to answer this question? Okay, so uh, probably I'll start. Uh, if you look at the different industries, so skill is not just to one particular uh, technical skill or something, but it, it, it depends on industry to industry. So first of all, you should focus on what industry, specific skills do they require for a particular industry and what are the evolving skills that are necessary in future. So having that things in mind, they keep they should continue to evolve because uh, having particular skill set of one industry which will not cater to another industry is just redundant. So there should be a balance between what is required and what is necessary for their uh, group. Yeah, so there is uh, no um, skill for all industry. We need to look at the particular industry first and uh, keep futuristic. Um, what about uh, Mr. Delano or Mrs. Ashma? Would you like to? Um, well, I, I don't mind. I don't mind chiming in. I, I would say in terms of the skill that I believe all youth need to embrace, um, and I've been having some conversations with some regional uh, youth leaders who I came up to the ranks with, and and we agree. That a lot of the times that there, 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 there is a need for our young people to recognize um, um, solid work ethic, um, preparation. It's, it's basic, simple skills that, that sometimes I think we take, for, we, think for, we take for granted. I mean, we would go into meetings now, um, being um, more senior persons in the ranks, and, and we see our youth leaders, and, our, and, and even within our business space, I used to uh, manage in, in the aviation sector for a while. And, and one of the things that always um, came across to me in terms of our youth is sometimes a lack of preparation, a lack of understanding of, you know, simple boardroom um, and accepted practices, best practices and so on. So, and, and, and with that too, we found that because of a lot of our younger staff members were sort of unsure of how to navigate the boardroom and the business context, their confidence suffered. And when their confidence suffered, their work suffered. And so I believe that if they equip themselves with some of these basic know-hows and, and so on, and some there's simple ways to do that, that they stand a better chance of, of, of sort of gaining influence when they step into the, into the workforce. Preparation is another element in terms of um, recognizing that you have to do your research about um, the entities that you're applying for. You have to improve your research skills. You have to uh, be able to, to sort of zone in and um, perhaps even weaknesses within the organization that you're applying for, because that helps. It helps when you're going into an organization to know how you want to contribute to make it better. If you just join in the organization to collect the salary or to be a part of the team, then, you know, quite often you're lacking the motivation. You know, when I take a job, I'm always thinking to myself, or even when I take a consultancy, I'm thinking to myself, what can I add? And I, and I think that's some of the mindset that, that, that I see lacking in, with, with, with some of our, um, our younger uh, professionals coming through the ranks. And also recognizing, too, that, you know, you, you, you have to start to speak up. And, and these are some of the skills. And when, when I say skills, it means because speaking up is an art. You can't be disrespectful. You can't come across in a particular way. It means you have to assert yourself, but in a respectful way that your peers take notice of what you're doing, but at the same time, you're not, you, you know, uh, you're keeping um, an, a, a sort of spirit of collegiality within the organization and so on. So, so these are some of the things just off the top and some of the softer skills that in my mind, uh, some of our younger professionals in particular need to remember uh, when they're jumping into uh, a career. 
Yes, thank you very much for the great tip. So according to you, preparation is definitely helpful and the youth have to have confidence. And um, yeah, indeed, like questions such as how can you add value to our company? Um, why should we hire you are the most commonly asked questions. And if as a candidate, you already have done research on the company, you know, where can you jump in and solve the issue? The company would feel that indeed you really know the company, you know the culture, you know the products and you can really add value. So that is very helpful indeed. And um, unfortunately, we only have three minutes left. Uh, we still have a question, which is what can be improved in providing financial services to youth? Um, if, uh, yeah, if our speaker can um, answer this question, maybe within two minutes, please. So, uh... Uh, uh, looking at my experience of uh, banking industry and uh, the financial aspect of a lot of areas, what I would say, what I have seen and what government as well as international organizations are promoting gradually is uh, uh, giving loans to small scale uh, individuals as well as small scale enterprises. Having said that, if, we, uh, if uh, every country has different laws and policies across from the banking industry sector to the uh, government policies, but if people closely look at and just uh, briefly follow what is being proposed by the government, you can see a lot of scholarships, financial aids, and a lot of opportunities that are gradually opened up by uh, organizations and government, which people can definitely use for themselves. At the same time, uh, a lot of online platforms and a lot of other resources, which are free of cost, is very readily available, which people definitely should use. And third, uh, what I would propose is everyone uh, should try to engage with a mentor because mentor is one of the uh, mentor uh, can just not even guide you on from the knowledge perspective but they can also guide you from the on the job learning experience perspective which can really be helpful and which cannot be which does not require any financial assistance so all these three factors can contribute to their growth thank you very much robbie uh, well, to, because of the time, uh, we have to end the session soon. So if I may uh, put together the key points of each speaker, that is um, upskill. There is no end point. Everyone has to put into efforts. And mentoring is definitely bringing differences to the life of the mentee, to their life and to the family. And there is a lot to cover to fill the gap and greater dialogue is necessary when policies made, youth presence is needed and diversity is greatly valued. And um, yeah, um, internship is also a beneficial step to take and we need employers to realize that youth is good business. Okay, um, that brings us to the end of the session today. Unfortunately, we have to say goodbye to each other. I hope you all enjoyed the session. Thank you so much, speakers. And we hope to see each other soon again. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Have a lovely afternoon. All right. Um, so hi, everyone. Um, I hope you are all well. It is heartwarming to see that despite the extenuating circumstances owing to COVID-19, the spirit of dialogue to combat the issues that face us today is well and thriving. And so in that very spirit of inclusion, we find ourselves today on the panel She Speaks, which is focused on addressing gender equality beyond 2021. Before we delve into the context of the session and uh, the ensuing discussion, I feel we should do a quick round of introductions. So um, starting off with myself, I am Bariha and I will be your moderator for the evening. I am originally from Karachi, Pakistan, and I'm currently working as a research analyst with Oxford Policy Management to improve health service delivery in the Khyber Pakhtunkhwa province of Pakistan. So um, now um, let's move on to our speakers for the evening. We have here with us Ms. Farhana Bulbulia, founder of Feminine Caribbean, Ms. Marina Kalin, Associate Project Leader Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, SRI, Ms. Amanda Abram, Program Manager, Global Schools Program, UN Sustainable Development Solutions Network, and Ms. Ashley Burnett, writer, teaching artist, and blogger. Um, it would be great if each one of you inspiring ladies could briefly introduce yourselves and we can then move on to our discussion. So starting off with you, Ms. Bulbulia. 
Thank you, Bariha. And um, well, I am Farhana Gulbulia, and I'm actually the founder of the Barbados Association of Muslim Ladies. We're a grassroots organization that was founded 10 years ago. So we celebrated our 10th anniversary last year to promote the socioeconomic and educational development of Muslim women and girls in Barbados. And um, I'm based in Barbados, beautiful island in the Caribbean. So thank you. I'm really happy to be here. Thank you for that, Ms. Kayla. Thank you. Yes, my name is Marina. Uh, I am originally from Switzerland, but I'm currently in Munich, in Germany. Um, I work within the field of executive search. And so they're in the industries of sports, of entertainment and fashion and lead an inclusion, uh, equity and diversity project to make sure that um, in all the searches that we do, we can really further um, people from different backgrounds and make sure that barriers within the labor market are decreased. Uh, Ms. Abra. Hi, everyone. Thank you. I'm so glad to be here. My name is Amanda Abram, and I'm from the United States, and I work with the Global Schools Program. We are an NGO, and we work with primary and secondary schools around the world to do teacher training and activities on sustainable development education, which includes gender equality, and I'm really excited to be here today. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Ms. Burnett, please. Hi, everyone. I'm Ashley Burnett, and I'm the founder of Family Caribbean. Um, which is an intersectional Caribbean feminist NGO, which really seeks to, you know, advance gender justice, looking at that through social good, education and conversation. And I'm also the chair of the Caribbean Women in Leadership Trans Vigo National Chapter, which seeks to increase the amount of women in um, politics and in decision making. Thank you. Thank you so much. Ladies, um, I feel like we have uh, more than a sound panel to have this, this discussion surrounding gender, um, you know, gender issues post-2020. So let's now begin with our discussion. I feel like before delving into the questions um, following that will be essentially guiding the discussion, um, it's important to sort of flesh out the very sort of, um, you know, context for why we're having this discussion in the first place. So progress in reducing gender inequality over the 20th century has been remarkable um, in terms of achieving basic sort of indicators in health and education and participation in markets and politics. So the Beijing Platform for Action during the 1995 Fourth World Conference of Women celebrated much of this progress. And as we celebrated the 20, 25th anniversary since Beijing in 2020, many challenges to equality remain, particularly for enhanced capabilities that alter power relations and enhance agency. Pervasive gender inequality is a human development shortfall globally, and many women and girls remain marginalized and lacking support for fundamental functions of human life. How then can governments shorten the projection of gender equality? We find ourselves here today to address the various nuances of that very question. Um, so uh, now that we have a bit of a background as to um, you know, why we're having this discussion in the first place, um, I would like to start off with my first question, which is for um, Ms. Farhana. So um, women have, of course, made big strides since the, since the start of gender empowerment movements. However, the gender gap still persists. What is it that we're missing out on by not maximizing the talents of both genders? Thanks for that question, Maria. I think to sort of bring the concepts of gender into to focus, I think for this question, we, the audience really has to understand what gender is in order to understand what gender inequality is. And although we're 10, 10 years away from, you know, um, a, the sustainable development goals, I think this concept is still very misunderstood. And it's often misunderstood against the, the concept of sex. So when someone is born, you know, whether they're born a man or a woman is biological, depending on what, you, what you're born as and, and sex is purely biological. Gender is how we socialize um, people based on the sex that they're born with and how, the, the, how society constructs ideals for men versus women and how this is then discriminated against so from the moment a woman is born you know it determines her level how, to what extent she's educated to what extent she's able to make decisions about her body um and, and the list goes on whereas when a, a man is you know when you're born as a man you know society dictates you know the jobs that you can have the your your pay that you will get just from simply your sex so i think understanding gender means you understand some of those socio cultural and religious constructs that are associated with your sex which is why in gender inequality uh, and 
it plays a fun understanding those nuances are important i think the question really speaks to you know what more can we do what more can happen and i think as a, a, a woman of color from a small island developing state who is a Muslim. I think understanding the lived experiences and the diverse experiences of women and girls is very, very, very important. Um, I mean, because when we do that, we understand the levels of, of discrimination. And I've seen those, those levels of discrimination in all aspects of my life. And the hard part for me is, is that I don't see very many women who look like me in forums like this at the decision making table, you know, sharing what is happening on to us on the ground. And because of that, we have experiences of women and girls being left out where nobody understands, where our voices are not heard. And the reality is, is that this is why we're not achieving gender equality, because we have a certain set of women in the room. We have a certain set of men in the room with certain ideas and perception and certain privileges. And it's until we get to the nitty gritty, to the persons who are most vulnerable and at risk and ensure that we understand how they're being affected, services that they're not access accessing, the opportunities that they're not accessing is when we will truly begin to make headway. Um, blanket responses no longer work. We cannot say that this is for all women. It's not possible. We have to understand the, the socioeconomic, educational, legal, and cultural barriers that are, that are affecting very specific demographic of women and girls. I think COVID has shown us that, shown us that in a way that we haven't seen before, because we recognize that the most vulnerable continue to be the most impacted. And we also recognize that not all opportunities provide entryways for all women. So we have to understand those nuances in order to really make headway by 2030. Thank you so much for that, Farhana. It's interesting that you talk about representation and it's, it's, it's even more interesting that you talk about, you know, questioning the very basis of how we define gender. Um, I feel like that ties very well into a question that I have for Ashley, which is that, um, you know, of course, financial mobility goes hand in hand with, um, you know, sort of achieving gender, uh, gender balance within society, uh, generally speaking. So how, do you think that there's room to increase gender awareness in sort of hiring practices? And, you know, when we're talking about salary negotiations and promotions? Yeah. Yeah. So there's always, always room to increase gender awareness, literally in every sector and every field that we will exist in. But what is important is thinking about what is the end result of increasing gender awareness, because you can be aware, you can know, like, yeah, I know that, that there are gender inequalities, but what do you do with that knowledge? And when you get that knowledge, what is important is ensuring that there's a gender transformative approach. So gender awareness is really great, but what comes next? And so there must be a gender transformative approach that seeks to explore the causes of these gender inequalities. So why is it that you will see women um, in the workplace who may not um, ask for promotion or negotiate salaries. And I'm pretty sure that everyone that's listening as a woman, you may have this kind of discomfort with asking about more money. I could never ask about more money or when am I getting paid or anything. It literally digs a hole inside of me. And that's because we're not socialized to doing that, right? And so what has to happen is with this gender transformative approach, um, you look at what these inequalities are and ask yourself, how is it that we've gotten there, right? So you're uprooting that entire gender inequality and then you create a framework, a policy, any type of intervention that really seeks to undo that and ensure that those who were oppressed that they are now treated fairly and given power and resources to lead a life deserving of just being a human being, because by virtue of being human, we deserve these things. We deserve to be able Absolutely. to enter into spaces and um, get equal pay, get you know um, all of these allowances that we deserve and not necessarily that we should have to fight for, but unfortunately we do. And so companies and organizations must engage in mandatory gender sensitization training to understand diversity and inclusion. Um, because I think a lot of people think diversity is inclusion and that um, once they have a diverse people that, yeah, we're good. When that's not the case, right? Diversity and inclusion goes hand in hand. You have to understand why is it 
necessary to have a diverse people? Why is it necessary to treat these diverse people as people and ensure that they have all of these um, allowances that we think it's, it's a luxury when actually it's not? Uh, like getting equal pay is not a luxury. People deserve that, right? And so these policies, um, they must be inclusive and consider the various experiences. And I know Farhana would have mentioned this before because we can never apply a, a one size fits all to every issue that exists, but we have to consider what the various experiences are of people within the workplace. Um, so of course, taking into consideration, you know, what the pandemic has unearthed. So like looking at care work, right? Are there work from home policies in place to support parents who have to stay at home with their children because schools are closed, right? And this all ties in looking at um, negotiation and pay and all of these things because you don't just negotiate payment but you negotiate um, the comfort levels as to what you're allowed or not um, is your organization or company one that has paid menstrual leave or has adequate paid paternity leave how is your company or organization ensuring that they are not reinforcing harmful gender rules and gender norms um, in their policies and in the way that they operate and of course we have to remember that you know, achieving an equal and equitable future. It can't be achieved with us working in silos. It definitely does um, include, you know, corporate bodies and private sector. Literally everyone has to have their hand on deck. If we are to liberate us all, uh, we have to work together to uproot it. Absolutely. I feel like this, this conversation is moving in a very interesting direction. Now we're talking about, um, you know, how work translates into remuneration for both genders, you know, um, what sort of, um, you know, social indoctrination that women generally tend to undergo, um, you know, how that affects the way that they ask, um, you know, to be treated as equals, not only within the workspace, but also within society. And, you know, um, with that, it, it's it's natural to think about, you know, equal pay. It's, it's natural to think about, you know, earnings and pension gaps and, you know, how poverty prevails specifically within um within you know like non-men sort of the gender spectrum um so my my next question would then be to amanda that how is it that we can reduce the gender pay gap how is it that you know we ensure equal earnings and you know uh work towards bridging the pension gaps and fighting po po poverty among women yeah thank you so much for that question and um the other panelists have already made great points on this topic um but the first thing i would say specifically on just reducing the pay gap is really it's important to increase transparency about what the pay gaps are but as ashley said that's not enough we have to go further than this um and we need to show people how to be advocates and what are those action pathways to assist women in negotiating to reduce the gender pay gap there are specific policies or interventions that we can do such as making sure there is paid family and medical leave for women and also making it easier for um, women to integrate back within the workforce if they take leave or if they feel like they were pressured to have a move for their um, partner's career in that case. Um, and eliminating discriminatory hiring practices is another thing that we can do. Um, in my workplace, I've seen that people are actually implementing um, bias training for interviews. I've had the ability to um, interview a lot of people, and it's very interesting to see the differences in how people speak about a project. If you are, um, uh, you know, a male or a female, people talking about the same project, a male will kind of say they did a lot more work, versus a female might not say that they did a lot of the project when they actually did, you know, the majority of the work. So I think it's important for interviewers and also people who are, you know, making decisions about salaries to understand why they might um, need more training for interviews or when they're actually speaking to women about um, projects. Right. So I guess we have essentially established the fact that just bridging gaps, um, you know, in a, in a tangible way is, is not sufficient. It's really just about, you know, transformational change, change that can be seen, um, you know, materializing in, in structures and organizations and institutions around us. So um, Marina, how, how then do you think that, uh, you know, stakeholders can support gender empowerment efforts? Oof, so many ways. And I just need to say, I really love all the, the, the answers that the previous participants have given. I love the intersectionality of gender by Firana. I love the policy making and it's, it's especially in the labor market, it's really, really important. And gender kind of woves through all the SDGs if we look at it, right? Um, it's, it's one of that, that it, it's so complex as an issue. So stakeholders, um, can support in different ways. 
And the first one goes back to what Firana says, it's representation. And that's for women, that's for all sorts of social, social categories or social demographics that we have, right? Um, for women, representation is absolutely crucial because seeing is believing, but also because um, when there's solutions developed for us, and that can be from simple products, that can be from policies, when women are not part of that decision-making process, the solution will not be suitable for them. And so we absolutely need to be present in um, political positions of power, in um, economic positions of power within businesses, um, because it changes the outcome and the solution and it makes it accessible to different groups of people, right? And um, so one of the simple, well, simple, um, complex ways, but one of the methods that is still sometimes debated, but are quotas, right? And so Norway, for example, a couple of years back, they've introduced a 40% women quota in politics, but also in um, uh, board and management positions, which obviously will take time to get there. But Norway's number three on the gender gap um, report from the WEF. And this is, it's, at the beginning, it's so difficult for people to get there or to take initiatives or to make structural changes because discrimination is seen as something that's individual. It's seen as something that was bad intent, this bad person who's trying to disadvantage somebody else. And the truth is it's not like that. It's collective, it's structural, and it's unintended. It sometimes happens with the best of intent. It happens in the hiring process, what Amanda said, um, it happens in social circumstances of being excluded from conversation. It happens in healthcare in so many different ways, right? And we need structural changes like quotas, like pay support um, for both parents or all parents involved, right? Um, we need in healthcare more accessibility for women. So for example, in countries where there's certain hours where women will work, making sure that in, that there's healthcare also available outside of those hours. Um, there's, it, it's a really complex issue, but it starts with representation from women and from different women, right? From women, um, as Pirana said, uh, who might not have the same life experience as other women within their, within their regional context, for example. Um, and that's, I think, where, where we initially can come in with quotas, with parental support, with access to healthcare, with decreasing violence, and with making sure that it stays intersectional, that it's not just for women, but for different sorts of women. Thanks for that. Uh, thanks for that, Marina. Um, I feel like um, it is important to recognize that not, not only is it about, you know, sort of ensuring that, you know, all individuals, regardless of their sort of um, gender or sexual orientations, you know, have, you know, access to basic rights. It's also about, you know, the sort of a positive impact that it can have on society at large. Um, right. Because we're, what we're essentially talking about is, is um, cognitive diversity and, and sort of, you know, the positive, positive elements that it brings to the table. Um, you know, how just, just, just by way of, you know, like our upbringings, you know, based primarily and exclusively on, you know, our genders, um, you know, how they can essentially shape the way that we think. Um, and so, um, you know, I, I have this question for you that um, what, what do balanced relations between men and women bring to the table? And why is it, you know, why is having open dialogues on gender related issues important? So much. Um, it, it, I mean, what it creates in a sense, it's, it's safe, it's inclusive, and it's productive societies, right? Um, and it brings to the table people who are different people have different life experiences. And this is very, in, in somewhat these, these bigger demographics like women and men, there's so much research on this. And it's not biological, as Kirana said, in terms of sex, it's because of our life experiences, because we learn different things, we're told different things, we come to different conclusions, we see different opportunities, right? And so I feel women's empowerment is, is one aspect and it's really, really important. And the second one afterwards is the dialogue about it because it's about the dynamic that happens between people who have different socialization, who make different assumptions um, and who will try to go to different outcomes sometimes, right? And when we combine an inclusive dialogue, it 
it, I mean, it's all the, the advantages that we know of diversity. It's in companies, it's higher financial performance, um, it's more innovation, it's um, higher engagement, people work harder, right? Um, and yet sometimes it's uncomfortable, right? Because if you're with all sorts of people who are the same as you, there's a flow, there's a certain exchange, it's easy, it seems effortless, and that doesn't happen if it's diverse. Not as much at the beginning. We need to work a little bit harder to get there. There might be some misunderstandings, but there's lots of research also showing um, that outcomes for solution finding are better. Um, again, that uh, employee satisfaction rate, for example, is a lot higher, that there's less sick leaves. The things that you don't necessarily um, associate with, uh, with gender or with that gender balance. Um, and I think what, what it also brings is it breaks down very um, toxic power dynamics, which are not really necessary, right? And yet they help and, and they have devastating effects on many, many women and people of other genders in terms of health, in terms of, uh, in terms of crime, in terms of advancement, in terms of the way they can contribute to the economy and labor market. Um, and that, it goes again back to that we need structural changes Right. We need people to be held accountable that it's not about good intentions, but that it's about, okay, let's make it easy for somebody to get there. What can they do? Are they, for example, in the hiring process? Uh, it's, most people want to be inclusive in hiring, but if time falls short, all of a sudden you go to your next network, you, you go for the simple recommendation, you try to get the shortcut, not out of bad yeah. intention, but just because... This is how our brain works. We associate um, what we know with what is good for us. And that's not true, <laughs> not necessarily. Um, and so the dialogue is important to get around that. And I believe it's important in there to not only talk about men and women, but to talk about the reality that there's a multitude of genders. Absolutely. Um, and there it takes also, it takes the pressure away of us versus them, you know, <laughs> Uh, it just and it opens our our minds and our hearts to not saying oh they want this and we want this, um, but to say okay so hold on what do you actually want what do you actually need what how would you like to contribute how can we make this work, and it also gives a whole bunch of people just the dignity to be part of society and to be recognized, and so the I know that in the UN context usually gender equality is about women, but it needs to be about gender, uh, people of different genders, non-binary folks and trans people and two-spirited and all sorts of different genders that are in all religions and all cultures and all regions, right? And I think that's the way forward. That's absolutely profound. Thank you so much for that, Marina. I feel like I, I really like threw this, this big question at you and I feel like you did a really good job of sort of oh, outlining the merits you. of... <laughs> I'm trying, I'm trying. <laughs> Just no, you did a great job, you know, like I, no, truly, I, I think you did a really good job of sort of, um, like, you know, fleshing out the merits of why it's important, um, you know, to sort of work towards gender equality. And it's it's really important to sort of break away from that gender binary and to sort of just, you know, think about the entire spectrum. And there's there's so much within that spectrum, you know, and, um, you know, it's interesting that you brought up the fact that it, it would sort of break that monotony of us versus them. It would be like, you know, all of us, like collectively you know, and, and just the different ways that we think and approach situations. Um, so now that, that we have sort of established that it's important uh, to be inclusive, um, Amanda, uh, Amanda, our question for you is that in what ways then can we increase, um, you know, sort of labor market participation and equal economic independence for, you know, all genders involved? Yeah, thank you so much for that question. Um, so I guess the short answer is we really need to move all the barriers that are preventing their full labor market participation. And these might be cultural, they might be political. Um, and like Farhana said, like every um, um, person or woman or all genders, the entire spectrum arena has, um, you know, different things that they are experiencing and we need to um, understand that. And in my work, which is very much focused on education, um, we believe it's first and foremost critical to ensure that girls have an equal right to education. As the data showed, it shows us in many cases, girls are faced with more significant challenges such as early marriage or household duties. And sometimes they aren't prioritized for education as far as their family members 
as getting them books or getting them uniforms. And this really sets them back later in life when we talk about full labor market participation. Um, so it's really the first step, um, primary education, secondary, and university is what I believe and what we believe. Um, so just to share one quick example. So one of the teachers that we were working with was working in a school where girls were never able to become class presidents or leaders of their school. But after doing some lessons on gender equality for the first time in the school's history, girls were finally able to be class presidents. So that are those are the things that we're trying to change. Um, we've seen teachers teachers do activities where students have had to switch roles and girls have to do household, um, excuse me, boys have to do household chores. And for the first time, boys realize that they should be helping their sisters with these tasks. Um, so that's another element, um, changing the culture. That's really important. Um, changing the culture to allow women to achieve full market participation, to own businesses, to participate in politics, and to be fully successful in whatever career path they choose, making it acceptable for them to take time off with their families, um, and making sure girls and women aren't condemned for pursuing um, any type of education or career path that they want. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Amanda. Um, so, I mean, obviously, Amanda talks about how, you know, um, just not just girls, you know, female children, but, um, you know, all kinds of children can sort of, uh, you know, break away the barriers into entering within the market market and labor force and you know sort of um you know just uh going in with a better clearer approach as to what they want and expect out of their experiences there um but of course once they've broken that barrier and gotten into the organizations themselves um what then are the chief obstacles um to achieving greater gender equality within organizations themselves ashley if you could um sort of tackle that question yeah of course so we know that across the region and the world at large, um, civil society organizations, they are leading the charge in advancing gender justice and gender equality. Um, I think literally in every part of the world, we see this, right? But this costs money. I mean, know that it costs a lot of money, um, but unfortunately, um, a lot of organizations struggle to get grants, right? And the reality of these organizations is that the available funds, they usually come from agencies and groups in the global north. And we know the Global North sometimes does not shape their corporate proposals in a way that is understanding of the various um, social contexts that exist of organizations and um, society in the Global South. So many times it's something that is very hard to shape what is happening to suit this corporate proposal. And many organizations sometimes just don't apply because it does not fit the context, right? And being inadequately funded is a major obstacle, especially in this pandemic, because there are people who are out of jobs and they need assistance. And you know, another obstacle is the lack of support of legislation by governments. So you have all these organizations doing this really hard work, but they're, consist they're consistently hitting walls because there isn't legislation to match, right? Um, there are LGBTQ organizations that does work for gender and sexual minority groups. There is abortion advocacy groups. There is sex work groups, right? But who are assisting historically marginalized groups. But when we look at what policies are there, <laughs> it's an empty box. There aren't any policies that's going to protect them. And so you're helping people to be liberating. You're helping people to be safe. But if something happens, where do you send them? And it's only so much that NGOs can do, right? It's only so much that organizations can do. And it's a constant process that's undone because when they set out to do this work, there's no support at state level. Um, and we see organizations also lacking the capacity to take on the work and not capacity in the sense of numbers. There are the numbers, there are people who are willing to do the work, but it is what do they, on, what, what can they do, right? Um, can they do the work that the communities actually need, right? Are their politics aligning to achieving this goal? Is, it, is their politics something that will actually advance gender equality, right? Are they actually using a human rights approach? Because from my personal experience, I have um, been requested to do some trainings from an NGO who would have then in turn asked me to not let people know that I'm queer. And then oh. it's like, yeah, you all happened to say it and I was very surprised, but it happened. So you can't be doing human rights work but then you're missing the human rights element. It makes no sense, right? Um, and so also recognizing that there are groups that say they have a human rights approach, but then maybe they're trans exclusionary. And so their feminism only serves one type of people. Um, mm -hmm. And also they don't have an intersectional approach, right? And if not, you know, what accessible 
avenues now exist for these um, organizations because once you recognize the gaps, there must be something to fix it. And oftentimes that doesn't exist. Um, and there's a lack of understanding of the tenets of gender equality, um, which causes the message to be lost most like almost all the time, right? And so those issues are some major obstacles that NGOs face within, you know, across the globe, not just here in the Caribbean. Um, and we have to recognize that gender equality, whilst we know that gender parity is a part of it, we have to think about, you know, what the outcome is of achieving that um, understanding about gender justice and that whole idea of redistrib redistributing power um, to ensure that those who are like most vulnerable can now come to the front um, and also making room for people who have physical and, and mental um, their abilities may be different from what we consider the norm and oftentimes people I hear this this saying so much about um, like let me be your voice or giving voice to the voiceless because they have a voice and this morning someone was saying that it's about giving them a platform because people are speaking it sometimes it just goes into the air because no one's listening um or it may not look the way that we want it to look but we also have to um recognize those biases and remove those biases um and the sad thing is that there isn't a regulatory body that seeks to um hold organizations accountable to make sure that if you're a, a feminist organization, if you're one that is doing gender justice work, that you're actually doing it and your politics are in line. Mm. And so it ends up where we have to hold each other accountable. And um, yeah, so those are some of the hard obstacles, but it's a journey. Yeah, that's unfortunate. See, it's 2021. It's about time that we sort of, you know, stop being so exclusionary in our politics. and. Um, yeah, you're right. It's it's about you know just ensuring that we bring every single body to sort of the same the same footing, right? Um, you can't um, you know un, un, unless you're not you know to the extent that you're not operating through a an, an intersectional lens, you can't possibly expect to sort of reach a point where you can truly claim that you know we've reached in an a, a utopia for equality. Um, and so that uh, brings me to my last question for the um, evening. Uh, this is. Uh, directed towards you for Hana. So if equity and equality were to be sort of imagined and conceptualized as two, um, uh, <laughs> two dimensions of a Cartesian plane, how is it that we achieve a true balance of the gender scale? I think there's a lot, I think there's a lot to unpack with that question, but I think, you know, in winding down the discussion, at the heart of what we're trying to achieve is, is changing mindsets. And one of the hardest things that I find in, in my daily work is being so motivated by conversations like these. But then when you go back to the grassroots and community level, the reality looks very different to the conversation that we have here. And at the heart of it is always about changing mindsets. And I think that that is the most crucial part of having these types of discussion is how do we bring that back down to the level of the average person who doesn't have the privilege to sit in conversations like these and you know I mean Ashley touched on some very important points I think and I and I want to reinforce them here there is funding there's lots of funding but what I've seen is that for example even organizations like my own we don't have necessarily the capacity to write the proposals. We don't have necessarily the capacity to put together something that suits what the funder wants. And therefore we're left out of, of the picture continuously. And, and that's really the crux of it. You know, we're working with communities that we know where women and girls do not have equal access to education, where we're not getting employment, where sometimes the barriers are as simple as employers saying you can't wear a hijab to work and we've seen that recently so that even if you're qualified even if you have all the experience simple legislation and policies like that keep women out and we don't have enough people speaking out and talking about these types of things and, and understanding how we connect on these issues so it goes beyond just a balancing. It's about really changing hearts and minds and seeing what that looks like within a, the perspective of, of where we stand, where we are. And I think when we speak about changing culture, it's not necessarily about changing culture. It's about changing harmful norms that look 
the same across you know communities across people and that's and that's the challenge and we speak about intersectional feminism and i think it's important to touch on that it is hard to do this work it is there's a lot of trauma involved in doing this work to the point where if you stand for certain things within certain communities, you can't say that you stand for certain things. And that's the reality of the work that we do. And I think it's also important to end by saying, as women of color, especially, we are at the margins of some of the harshest trauma and the harshest criticism and discrimination. And until we recognize that, we really won't be achieving gender equality. That, that that was a very strong end to our discussion. I feel like a very strong message that you put out and, you know, for, for people who are, um, you know, listening. Um, and with that, I, uh, I feel that it's time that we open the floor to any questions. Um, sadly, all good things must come to an end. We are drawing to a close to the, to, you know, the session itself. So it would be great that if there are any questions from the audience, they're kept precise and to the point. So um, if there are any questions, it would be great if they can be directed to us right now. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> I think, um, I think the organizers are supposed to be flagging questions towards us. Um, you know, perhaps, uh, you know, I am technologically challenged, so perhaps there's something, something uh, going on on this end that, uh, you know, sort of I'm, I'm skipping out on, but considering that we're essentially already out of time, I feel like um, we should just move on to uh, closing remarks. And so that, you know, with that, we have essentially come to the end of the session. So thank you so much for attending every single one of you, every single one of you, um, you know, brilliant people, particularly our very, very inspiring speakers for today. Um, and, um, you know, I'd just like to end the session by saying that while the struggles for reaching a gender balanced utopia continues, it is conversations and platforms like these that allow us to begin to understand how to sort of streamline our efforts in addressing issues pertaining to gender equality. And so, you know, um, keep indulging in healthy discourse and ask not what the status quo can do for you, rather what you can do to make the status quo better. So, um, you know, more importantly, keep asking important questions, the right questions. And with that, we cap today's discussion. Stay safe and healthy, everyone. Um, that's, that's, <laughs> all right. Bye. <laughs>